Super Smash Bros. is a franchise I've grown up with. From its humble N64 beginnings to now with Smash Ultimate, it's amazing to see how much of its core design has stood the now 25-year test of time. Smash is far more than a premise, however. It can appeal to every demographic, old and new, competitive and casual, whoever you are, you can find some fun here. One community in particular has risen to be a monolith of what Smash Bros. as a series is perceived as. It's a community that vehemently rejects Smash Bros. creator Masahiro Sakurai's goal of Smash as a party game. One that fights not only in-game, but against corporate hegemony all to claim glory amongst themselves. This group being the competitive Smash Bros. community. This group of dedicated individuals managed to craft an esport out of a casual party game. Competitive Smash isn't just a mode within any Super Smash Bros. title. Rather, it's a set of rules defined through community consensus in order to facilitate this form of gameplay. It is arguably antithetical to the design of Smash Bros. as intended, yet clearly there is enough worthwhile depth and complexity to have persisted for so long. In this unaffiliated race to see who is best, Competitive Smash forces players to master the bare-bones mechanics of gameplay. In doing so, players have become far better than the designers ever could have anticipated. This split between Competitive Smash and people with girlfriends, I mean casual Smash players, is like heaven and earth. I want to preface that I love Smash Bros, and I especially love Competitive Smash Bros. I've attended my fair share of local tournaments, competed in a regional collegiate league, and even attended a major or two. Yet, I have never even come close to winning, so why do I even bring this up? I find myself in a frustrating predicament. I am unable to play Smash anymore, or more realistically, nobody wants to play with me. I have become so much better than my friends, who never took the game seriously, that hindering myself sufficiently is no longer an option. Additionally, I'm just not interested in competing anymore. It's far too much of a time investment nowadays, which leaves me in this liminal space, unable to play with either side. This is certainly a first world problem. Nevertheless, I think this can also be used as an opportunity to explore the stellar design of the Smash Bros series. What makes the game succeed both as a casual party game and a competitive esport simultaneously? This video focuses primarily on Smash Ultimate, however, many lessons learned from this version are just iterations on a formula that spanned a generation. Let's start by discussing why Smash is effective as a casual party game. To do so, we should define what casual even means. The best answer I could come up with is casual Smash is anything that's not competitive Smash. This definition accomplishes a whole lot of nothing except begging the question of what is competitive Smash? The answer is far more complex than Fox only Final Destination no items, so let's answer that instead. While the precise rules vary from game to game, the philosophy of competitive Smash aims to uphold competitive integrity and promote player skill while minimizing variance. Competitive Smash uses timed stock matches on hand-picked stage lists, minimizing any variance-creating mechanics. Viable stages are generally symmetrical, flat, hazardless, with no walk-offs and all with relatively similar blast zones. This philosophy results in significant portions of the game's total feature list being entirely ignored to facilitate this gameplay. All that being said, competitive Smash is the exception, not the rule. Casual Smash comprises everything Smash Bros has to offer, while competitive Smash cherry-picks specific aspects of the game to facilitate a community-directed form of competitive play. Of course, this isn't an argument against the existence of competitive Smash, rather it's just a defining of terms so we can all be on the same page moving forwards. Casual Smash is what Smash Bros was designed as, a party game. I am sure most people started playing through this casual lens. It requires some research to even learn what competitive Smash the eSport is. The competitive community only contributes to a sliver of the 32 million copies sold, just for Ultimate. However, despite the community's size relative to the greater whole, competitive Smash has an undeniably massive weight in Smash Bros's reputation and perception. I'll touch on this point later on. Starting with the premise, Smash differentiates itself from other fighting games simply because of its genre. Single-handedly pioneering platform fighters as a genre, Smash Bros uses the character's position as a metric for success. 
Health-based fighting games like Mortal Kombat or Street Fighter challenge the player to reduce their opponent's health bar without their own being reduced. In contrast, the challenge in Smash is to launch foes offstage and keep them there. Whether this is achieved through an attack's sheer knockback or through preventing an opponent from recovering, the number of hits a given character takes is rarely the deciding factor. The nature of platform fighters being physics-based means the spatial element of gameplay is placed at the forefront. Not every hit will launch an enemy into the blast zone, but every hit will change their position. Depending on where fighters are located relative to each other and the stage itself, various game states can emerge. Positioning in Smash is a visual signifier of what options are available to the players and who among them has the advantage. This concept is further perpetuated through the percentage system, which increases how far and fast a character is launched when taking a hit. While percentages are not the most clear way of showing who is winning, it does accomplish the goal of building intensity. Further increasing accessibility, Smash Bros. takes a very simplistic yet effective approach to its control scheme. Every move is mapped to the same universal inputs that vary depending on the character state. All moves are just variations on the formula of hold direction plus press button. This straightforward control scheme reduces the knowledge barrier for learning each move to simply require players to point their joystick in the direction of an opponent and mash a button. In contrast to other contemporary fighting games where quarter circles and input strings are commonplace, this ease of use is essential to onboarding new players. There are complicated inputs in Smash that aren't directly transferable between characters. However, even for those characters, universal inputs still follow trends applicable to every character. For instance, most characters' up specials are recovery moves that grant vertical and or horizontal height. Smash attacks, though varied between each type, all retain a similar design philosophy as well. Forward smashes typically have the best horizontal knockback at the cost of only hitting in front of the character, down smashes have a weaker knockback but cover both sides of the character, and up smashes send their targets upwards, making it easier to KO opponents anywhere on the stage. These input trends allow players to familiarize themselves with one character and directly transfer those skills to any other. Where other fighting games create distinct movesets and mechanics for each member of their roster, Smash removes that barrier to entry entirely. This generic form of control scheme has the added benefit of allowing larger playable casts without notably increasing the overall learning curve. Building the fundamental gameplay skills in Smash with any character allows players to safely experiment without being required to memorize combo lists or frame data charts. Furthermore, with Smash Bros. homogenized input scheme, it grants players the benefit of sight reading. If I see a new move, I can analyze what state the character was in and what direction the move faced to recreate the same move when I attempted in the future. Sight reading evolves into outright predicting with enough experience. Understanding what tools are available to a character at any given point is a major underpinning of the rock-paper-scissors dynamic comprising much of competitive Smash. Shielding beats attacking, attacking beats grabbing, and grabbing beats shielding. These cyclical sets of options are integral to understanding the more nuanced aspects of competitive Smash. I've spent the last few minutes analyzing the baseline mechanics of Smash while entirely ignoring what makes the casual Smash Bros. experience so appealing. Ironically, this key concept is the same thing the competitive Smash Bros. community aims to rid itself of, variance. The heart of Smash Bros. is found in the ignored features by competitive standards. Squad Strike, Special Smash, 8-Player Smash, Classic Mode, Mob Smash, Home Run Contest, Amiibos, Stage Builder, Adventure Mode, the thousands of collectibles, dozens of stages and items, challenges, achievements, and otherwise. These modes and features comprise the lion's share of Smash Bros.'s identity, design, and content. It's clear that Smash is developed as a wacky, nonsense party game that seeks to merge spectacle with silliness. When running on all cylinders, Smash Bros. is a party game using fighting game mechanics. It aims to disrupt flow, incite chaos, and be as bombastic as it possibly can. Stage transitions may drag you to the bottom of the map, or an assist trophy may turn the screen black. All these features are working actively against the goals of the players. It's a proven design philosophy for party games. Variance is fun because players can always expect a novel experience in each match. You can never predict who will win from the get-go because random elements can and will throw wrenches into each player's game plan. I use the term casual often because it implies a type of gameplay that aims to facilitate a low-stakes, for-fun experience. While winning may not be a prime motivator for the casual audience, promoting the idea that each player has a chance of winning is vital. It's not fun if players know the outcome of a match before it even starts, even if they don't care about winning themselves. This is why I keep saying that Smash is not just a fighting game, it's a party fighting game. Competitive Smash is a separate entity entirely, 
a fighting game in spite of its container. I think now is where we can properly dive a bit deeper into the competitive side of Smash and see how it pushes these mechanics to their limits. Competitive Smash Bros is a sight to behold. This community has managed to persist for more than two decades. Despite Nintendo itself sending cease and desist letters to tournament organizers, or through the purging of unsavory individuals from the community, Competitive Smash still retains an active player base to this day. While admirable on its own, the Competitive Smash community pushes Smash Bros's mechanics to almost insurmountable heights. Much of Competitive Smash's persistence can be attributed to its community. Fighting games often hold in-person tournaments largely for technical reasons, such as mitigating lag. However, the in-person nature of these tournaments serves double duty, allowing anyone to mingle with and potentially play against certain idolized figures of that community. Competitive games create narratives through meritocracies, therefore having the chance to test your mettle against pillars of the game is one hell of an incentive. Furthermore, the content creation space pushes competitive Smash as the main means of play. Those dedicated enough to search for content on the game are immediately met by these competitive players. This opens up a wormhole of ancillary content like guides, challenge runs, tournament analysis, or even competitive Smash's history. Take, for instance, the Smash Brothers, a four-hour, nine-part docuseries telling the fascinating stories of the budding competitive Smash community. Spanning from Smash Melee's release to EVO 2013, the show dives into some of the most notable players from this early age. Many figures highlighted in this prolific series remain prominent members of the community to this day. I myself still have my original GameCube controller signed by many of these prolific players. Community drives far more than perception, however. With the assistance of dedicated individuals, the competitive Smash community catalogs, scrutinizes, and abuses every possible mechanic to its fullest effect. Concepts like frame data, aerial drift, initial dash speeds, recoveries, neutral, advantage, disadvantage, combos, X-factors, and all aspects of a character, and their supposed optimal playstyles are just the tip of the knowledge iceberg. Beyond just mechanics, metagame play such as reading your opponent, learning their habits, and conditioning them to perform specific actions adds a whole new layer of depth to this formula. The level of mastery required to perform tight inputs while analyzing the game's state is exponentially increased when adding the mental game underlining everything. What separates good players from great ones is this hidden layer of depth. It's not necessarily hard to hit a combo on an enemy not fighting back. What is hard is landing that same combo on an opponent doing all in their power not to get hit or avoid subsequent hits all the while trying to do the same thing to you. These intrapersonal aspects of gameplay expand into baiting and punishing. Using unsafe moves, especially when the opponent is shielding, leaves the attacking player vulnerable to a counterattack. Particularly in Smash Ultimate, with its eons worth of built-in input delay, reacting to most attacks is almost entirely impossible. This is why predictions are so vital to achieving success in Smash. Mastering the baseline mechanics is merely the first of many steps of an incredibly tall staircase. Having done a bit of this grind myself, ingraining movement, defensive options, combo strings, and simple reads into my baseline gameplay only marginally improved my results. At the highest level, players aren't even considering what moves they should use. There isn't enough time for that. They recognize situations, patterns, and rely on honed muscle memory and immaculate decision-making to perform optimal actions. Many top-level talents liken matches of competitive Smash to conversations, with movement, attacks, and decisions taking the place of words. The split between casual or semi-casual Smash to competitive is far more than just a knowledge barrier. Success in competitive Smash is founded upon mastering inputs, meta-mechanics, and recognizing habits. To rise to the level competitive Smash demands, it takes a particular disposition or temperament. You need to be prepared to lose countless times and work to improve upon those mistakes. For a competitive player, this is the fun of the experience. However, this is also a significant barrier to entry for those without that necessary temperament. Passing this skill barrier is a one-way ticket. You can't go back to playing casually without incorporating advanced movement mechanics, defensive options, or furthering your character's game plan without intentionally handicapping yourself. While the proficiency of your gameplay may wane without consistent practice, those fundamentals never fully go away.
as a Smash player, I'm on the precipice of all right to decent. I can fairly consistently place between 0 and 2 to 2 and 2 at a local tournament. I've practiced for hundreds if not thousands of hours through multiple versions of Smash, slowly honing those aforementioned skills into my gameplay. Unbeknownst to me, all this practice resulted in achieving a level of skill that alienated me from the casual Smash experience. Now years after my heyday, with the time I can and want to dedicate towards practicing significantly reduced, I cannot progress or regress sufficiently to play with either of these distinct communities. I habitually shield, I habitually short hop and fast fall. I know each character's move set by heart and can execute those moves on demand. This isn't a matter of applying a handicap, it's asking me to play against intuition. Survivability, shielding, positioning, movement, DI, option select, and other minor knowledge-gated mechanics make bridging this gap for a non-competitive player nearly insurmountable. I brought up variance as a key appeal of the casual Smash Bros experience. With items, stage hazards, or the innumerable amounts of jank that can occur within a given Smash game, it feels like any skill disparity can be mitigated. This, unfortunately, is far from the case. Given the breadth of knowledge competitive Smash entrenches in its players, most, if not all, of these quote-unquote random factors can be avoided or even leveraged to a knowledgeable player's benefit. For example, while randomly spawning items are banned in competitive rule sets, many characters have items built into their move sets and abuse them to great effect. Therefore, learning how to play with and against items is a necessary skill for competition. Placing a competitively trained Smash player into a match with items is only arming them with more ammunition. <laughs> Furthermore, while the chaos of a large multiplayer fight can certainly increase variance, emerging from these matches is trivial through proper positioning, defensive play, and leveraging bait and punish mechanics. Competitively versed players can slowly whittle the amount of foes down to a more manageable number either by their own hand or just through the rest of the players hitting each other. Even if they play aggressively, that player is still likely to emerge victorious through sheer skill alone. In my case, I never play all out in a casual setting. I'm well aware of my gameplay skill and actively take steps to mitigate those peaks. I choose random characters, I encourage the use of all sorts of variance producing mechanics, and I throw myself into the middle of fights. However, without actively hindering myself like throwing myself off stage or doing any number of actions to even the gap, I can still generally take first in most matches. The issue lies with the fact that a victory earned through a handicap feels worse than one earned on your own merit. It's equally unfun to lose to the same player over and over again as it is to only win because that player let you. This dilemma stems from balancing the social expectation of casual gameplay with the reality of a massive skill discrepancy. To realistically handicap myself, I would have to set myself to a single stock, perhaps with some tacked on percentage to even get close to a fair fight. Even so, imagine the demoralizing feeling the other players would have if I managed to win from those odds. So here I am, left in a situation where I don't want to get better, but I cannot physically or mentally unlearn the practiced fundamentals I'd spent years improving. Competitive Smash ruins the game for me because nobody wants to play with me anymore. It's gotten to the point where I have to warn people about my skill prior to playing, as to not immediately sour them on the gameplay experience. I am doing so all while knowing I am far inferior to a majority of the Smash community. This isn't a trait unique to Smash. Rather, it's a problem that populates most if not all competitive games. Have you ever played with someone who is really good at Mario Kart? And I mean really good at Mario Kart. It's the same type of idea. With fighting games in particular, due to their gameplay focus being entirely dependent on technical mastery, they exacerbate any skill difference to the point where it becomes inaccessible to a new or casual audience. There really isn't a solution to this. It's just a side effect of getting better at a game. I wish I could have known that the knowledge barrier for Smash was a one-way street. Before I knew anything about the game competitively, I enjoyed the casual, hectic, and incredibly customizable experience. I played so much I felt the need to get better, choosing to grind for thousands of hours chasing what ended up as a pipe dream. I won't lie and say that my desire to improve was for virtuous reasons. 
It was just a case of a competitive teenager with a superiority complex wanting to win and studying how. Now, with that spark snuffed, I'm left stranded without anyone I want to play with wanting to play with me. At least, not for very long. Smash Bros. The Game and Smash Bros. The Esport are two diametrically opposed and separate entities. I misattributed my love of Smash to its gameplay when the fun of it was playing with my friends. However, my drive to improve eventually led to me being so ahead of them they couldn't ever catch up. Looking back, I won't remember the hundreds of tournament matches I played, thousands of hours spent labbing training mode combos, I won't remember practicing inputs or just playing online. What I will remember is beating the subspace emissary, glitch hunting, or crafting bonkers custom modes, all with my friends. Of course, this is only my experience and is not meant to invalidate your own. Competitive Smash as a community is one that I and many others cherish. I continue to watch and support Competitive Smash despite scarcely playing myself nowadays. My understanding of the more nuanced aspects of Smash certainly grants a deeper appreciation for the eSport, yet what I truly love about the game are the simple moments of chaos spent laughing with my friends. Hopefully they'll improve enough that I can play with them again. That's the end of the video. If you liked it, hit the like button, and if you didn't, hit the dislike button. Or don't, I'm not your dad. It's been about a year since I last posted, but if you like what you see, subscribe to the channel. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you for watching.